Hey everyone, this is Professor Rivera Mitu. Today I will be talking about preterm labor and postterm labor. So first let's talk about preterm labor. Preterm labor is defined as labor that happens before 37 gestational age and um, it comprises both of regular uterine contractions as well as cervical effacement and dilation. So before we look at what happens when there's preterm labor and how we can stop it, let's first look at the risks, uh, risk factors that is that are involved with preterm labor. So any infections that the mom has had, uh, maybe a positive GVS that led to UTI, uh, current chorioamnionitis, um, which uh, likely will happen uh, with rupture of membranes, vaginal uh, bacterial vaginosis and uh, STI, such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomoniasis. Um, some OB or GYN issues that mom already has, such as um, uh, multi-pregnancies, gestational hypertension, um, history of preterm birth, for uh, and, and in which case the mom would uh, likely receive progesterone injections either on a daily basis or a weekly basis um, to maintain the pregnancy. A um, short interpregnancy interval, which means a mom has had two pregnancies in one year, um, that increases the chances of them having a preterm labor just because of the fact that the, uh, the GU uh, and reproductive system has not had enough time to recover. And a uh, premature rupture of membranes can lead to uh, preterm labor because that rupture of membranes will signal the cervix to dilate in the face as well as start uterine contractions. Um, uterine um, abnormalities such as fibroids, uh, which are called leomyomas, and these are benign um, tumors, if you will, that are in the uterus. They could be on the outside layer of the uterus. They could be in the myometrium or they could be in the endometrium. Um, and um, as the, with most of these fibroids, as the uh, fetus grows, the fibroid also grows and um, commonly robs the, the fetus of the nutrition that it should be getting. Hydramnials or polyhydramnials, um, can signal the to the mom's brain that the uterus is big enough because in hydramnios it will be stretched out. Um, and so the brain might think that, oh, you have a 40, 40 week size um, uterus. So therefore you are likely to deliver, uh, you are um, ready to deliver. And so that could cause preterm labor. And then, and uh, so does um, LGA um, in correlation with that. Placental abnormalities such as placenta previa or abrupt show can cause preterm labor. Cervical abnormalities such as cervical insufficiency wherein the cervix is weak um, or the a short cervix that is less than 2.5 centimeter, um, which means that it will be faster for the cervix to dilate, sorry, to efface um, because it's already short to begin with. And so that could cause preterm labor. There are some um, socioeconomic factors as well that could um, lend to prenatal labor due to uh, different circumstances such as lack or no prenatal care and not knowing if there's something wrong with the fetus to begin with. Um, substance abuse uh, that likely also uh, may be related to domestic violence. Domestic violence could be related to placenta abrupt show all of which can uh, be factors that increase the risk of preterm labor. Um, low socioeconomic status that could lead to poor nutrition, um, not eating the right uh, food. It could mean either not eating enough food or eating the wrong types of food that are cheap, such as you know fast foods, like a dollar burger um, and things like that that obviously will also lead to um, other 
um, pregnancy complications such as gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, or uh, gestational diabetes mellitus. Lack of education of, of just um, regular healthcare, um, checkups, annual checks, checkups for, uh, sorry, every six months dental checkups or annual health checkups um, can lead to a condition such as periodontal diseases wherein um, there's bacteria um, that the mom may be ingesting because of uh, the lack of um, uh, periodontal care. So that could lead to mom's illness, which can lead to preterm labor. And as we had discussed, maternal health issues such as hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, stress, which causes the sympathetic nervous system to, to be activated, releasing more cortisol, releasing um, the uh, norepinephrine, which increases blood pressure and increases the sugar. Um, or moms who have low weight for height, again, which uh, kind of is correlated with malnutrition, um, can lead to preterm labor. And statistically, uh, as far as ethnicities, African-Americans, and as far as age, um, moms who are less than 16 or greater than 40 year old uh, are at higher risk for preterm labor. So how do we know that the mom is at risk for preterm labor? Uh, they can do a fetal fibronectin test. So think of fibronectin as the glue that attaches the amniotic sac to the wall of the uterus. And this is commonly present up to 22 weeks of gestation um, as the fetus is developing. And then, uh, and then it you know should subside and should no longer be um, available um, by 24 weeks. So if we do see it um, in the cervical vaginal area, so they'll they'll take a swab of the uh, vaginal in the cervix area, and um, if between if that is done between 24 to 34 weeks, um, it should not be present. And if it's negative, then that uh, likely tells us that the mom is not going to go to labor in the next two weeks. However, if it is positive uh, with a value of greater than 0 0.05 micrograms per milliliter, then there likely will be a preterm delivery in the next 7 to 14 days. So if there is a preterm uh, delivery, we know that as far as complications to the fetus, um, there is a higher chance of uh, RDS or respiratory distress syndrome caused by the immature lungs of the baby. And in order to uh, try and prevent RDS from happening, um, if the fetal fibronectin is positive or there are signs that mom is dilating, um, and the baby is less than 34 weeks of age, uh, then the mom should be given a bevimetasone shot um, two times with a 24 hour period interval. And the bevimetasone will increase the pr production of the surfactant and um, promote lung maturity in the baby, hopefully um, decreasing the chance of RDS. There are also gonna be immature brain cells and immature blood vessels. And so that increases the likelihood of intraventricular hemorrhage um, with preterm labor. So in order to manage or to slow down this preterm labor, um, we would need to address what is happening, which is the regular uterine contractions or the cervical effacement and dilation. So there are several medications that have a tocolytic properties. Tocolytic meaning tocal pressure lytic uh, breakdown. So literally breaking down the pressure, which is the uterine contraction. Uh, in order to do that, um, there's several uh, mechanisms of actions that we would need to consider. One is the mom can get magnesium sulfate, um, likely as a drip or IV. And um, we know that in a large dose, uh, magnesium sulfate is a CNS depressant. And because it relaxes 
the CNS, it relaxes the muscles. And so that could help with um, decreasing the uterine contraction. And this is also a medication that is used in preeclampsia to prevent eclampsia and prevent seizures uh, and also manage the, the blood pressure somewhat because of the decreased CNS uh, mechanism of action. Another medication that might be considered is a calcium channel blocker, uh, such as nifedipine or procardia is a, is a trade name. So calcium channel blocker, they act by blocking the calcium into the, the muscle. Um, as we know, CCB is a class of antihypertensive that I had discussed in one of my previous videos uh, regarding RAS and regarding hypertension. But calcium, is, you should associate with tonicity. So what calcium does is increases the tonicity of the muscle and the, and the uh, blood vessel wall. So when we block calcium, in this case, we're blocking calcium in the myometrium, then it decreases the tonicity of the uterus, therefore relaxing the uterus and stopping the, the uh, uterine contractions. The other class of medication is your um, NSAIDs. Um, so NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, are actually prostaglandin inhibitors. And so indomethacin is a type of a prostaglandin inhibitor in a way that um, uh, it actually is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. And then when this enzyme is inhibited, it decreases the synthesis of prostaglandin and therefore decreasing prostaglandin. And as we know, prostaglandin is involved in uterine contractions as well as dilation and effacement of the cervix. Um, prostaglandin outside of uh, preterm labor is actually a drug that will be used, and we'll talk about more of that in the post-term uh, labor. Prostaglandin is, is a endogenous hormone that the mom would have and that it would increase along with relaxin at the um, time of, of delivery um, to do just that, which is to efface the cervix and dilate the cervix and also contribute to a more regular uterine contraction. So in this case, because this is preterm labor, we don't want that to happen. Um, anytime, however, that we are giving a prostaglandin inhibitor, it is important to note that this, one of the side effects of that is that the patient may have some GI disturbance, some gastric irritation, because prostaglandin is, is also important in protecting the GI mucosa. And so when we're giving a prostaglandin inhibitor, we are disturbing that GI mucosa, causing um, irritation to the GI tract uh, and causing um, not just gastric irritation, but can even lead to peptic ulcer disease. And so um, if the mom already has an issue like that, it may be a good idea to consider uh, medication to counter that side effect, such as a PPI or an H2 blocker. The other type of medication um, that is also still commonly used in some hospitals is terbutaline. So terbutaline is a beta adrenergic agonist. So this class, if you recall from pharmacology, is a class that is used um, in lung disease, uh, particularly in asthma, wherein there is bronchoconstriction. Um, so uh, because of the beta adrenergic action of this, uh, adrenergic drugs or sympathetic drugs or sympathomimetic drugs, they um, relax the smooth muscle. And so some of the muscles that we're talking about are, again, the muscles of the lung. But in this case, what we are after is relaxing the uterine muscle. Um, and so this is an effective tocolytic. However, um, it, it is important to also note that an adverse effect of terbutaline um, can be pulmonary edema due to excessive uh, relaxation of the, um, the uh, bronchioles and um, bronchi. And uh, also because um, uh, this is a tocolytic, um, we don't wanna give it any more 
if the mom is at about 36 weeks of, of gestational age or, or greater, um, because at that point, and this is likely true with um, a few of these other meds here that, that cause um, smooth muscle relaxation, um, we don't need to stop labor at this time because uh, this is considered a late preterm and um, it, it is likely safe for the, the fetus to be delivered at this time. And some other things to consider here um, is that one of the factors that can be a contributor to um, regular, uh, to preterm contractions, premature contractions is dehydration. So we, we could kind of look at this as, you know, when we're dehydrated, when the mom is not getting enough um, of fluid in their body, then um, the posterior pituitary gland can be activated. And um, we have learned that there are two hormones that come from the posterior pituitary, pituitary gland, which is ADH, which is an antidiuretic hormone, um, the purpose of which is to uh, reabsorb the, the water um, if mom is dehydrated so that she could you know, conserve her water. However, oxytocin also comes from the posterior pituitary gland. And so inadvertently when ADH is released, oxytocin is released from the posterior pituitary causing more um, uterine contractions. And so mom should be drinking um, at least two to three liters of water a day. And sometimes they'll tell them even four liters a day. Um, when they're having premature contractions, um, just so you don't have this other factor here that could contribute to the contractions. And that is preterm labor. And now we're going to talk about post-term labor. So post-term pregnancy, no, sorry, not post-term labor, post-term pregnancy, no labor, is pregnancy that is greater than 42 weeks. Um, and so in order to help this mom deliver the baby, there's two things that could be done. One is it could be a labor induction um, or it could be an augmentation. So labor induction, we're inducing labor, which means the mom um, uh, has not started labor yet. So mom is not uh, has not started labor yet. And so we want to induce, we want to start labor. As opposed to, it can also be just labor augmentation, wherein um, mom had started labor, um, but it's very slow. So that kind of goes back to uh, something that uh, I had discussed in class with regard to maybe a arrest disorder or a protracted disorder um, situation or um, maybe a hypotonic uterus, wherein the the uh, progression of labor um, is slow, too slow. So there are three types of interventions that can be done for this. And the first one that, it, that uh, typically will be uh, considered first is a pharmacological intervention. So in a pharmacological intervention, there's um, two types of medications that the mom may receive one of which is oxytocin. And as we had uh, discussed previously, oxytocin will increase uterine contraction. And so um, that can hasten the, um, the delivery process a little bit. Or the other thing that will be given, can be given is um, again, the prostaglandin that we had uh, previously discussed. And so, um, the the a purpose of which is to help ripen the cervix and therefore um, causing cervical effacement and dilatation. And so the drugs that typically you will see are cervical and cytotec, so misoprostol or dinoprostone that can be given. Um, misoprostol typically is given as a buccal medication. So it's a tablet that um, they'll put between the, um, the mom's gums and cheek, and then you just let it melt. And um, then it'll, you know, mom should start having contractions and having cervical dilatation and effacement um, upon intake of that. It takes maybe about, I would say 15 to 30 minutes um, 
depending on the um how how uh, dry the mouth is of the mom um, the drier it is, the longer it's going to take for this medication to to uh, be absorbed, to melt and be absorbed. Some key things to remember about oxytocin. Um, we want to monitor the action of oxytocin. We would want to look at the contractions and look at the duration and frequency. We don't want it to be um, very frequent and uh, uh, to the point that it causes tachycystole. So tachycystole is defined as more than five contractions in 10 minutes, because as we have learned, the frequency of the contraction should be no more frequent than every two minutes, uh, which therefore, if it's every two minutes, will give us five contractions in 10 minutes. So anything girded in that is tachycystole. Um, it could also um, cause hypertonic uterus, um, and those could both lead to uh, utero placental insufficiency, which could lead to late D cells in the fetus. And so um, that's why if a mom is in, is in oxytocin and we see late D cells, we are going to stop the oxytocin um, because it is now affecting the baby's perfusion. Some side effects of oxytocin is um, decreased um, urination. Um, and of course, if there's decreased urination, that means that there is more uh, fluid accumulation in the body and can cause fluid overload. And again, um, that is due to uh, partially to its involvement with ADH. So um, that is the uh, most uh, common and typically first thing that they would look at in induction of pregnancy. However, there are other things that can be done. Um, they can have technically what is a surgical uh, management, which is either an amniotomy in which they um, will use this type of instrument that looks like a uh, something that you would use to crochet. Um, it's called an amnia hook. And so it is used to rupture the membrane. And in which case we will call that an ARAM, artificial rupture of membranes, as opposed to SHRAM, which is a spontaneous rupture of membrane. So um, Rupturing the membrane signals again to the mom's body that um, uh, labor should now continue or should uh, begin or should hasten if this is an augmentation. Um, and it's going to signal the, uh, the body to increase the relaxin and increase the prostaglandin um, and increase, increase the oxytocin, which are the hormones that are increased at term that will cause the cervical dilatation and effacement as well as uterine contractions. The other one that they can do is a stripping of the membrane. So stripping or sweeping of the amniotic membrane kind of looks like this, um, where they technically kind of peel off the amniotic sac off of the, um, the uterine wall. Um, and then I'm um, hoping that, you know, that will, trigger the rupture of the membranes and the dilatation and effacement of the cervix. Um, lastly, there could be a mechanical management. So mechanical manage management, the intent of which is to increase the pressure um, in the cervical os or the cervix. And um, once there's a lot of pressure in the cervix, so it's kind of like the body is, is thinking that, oh, there's a lot of pressure in my cervix because there's a fetus there, um, you know, such as when the, the fetus has already engaged um, and is coming down, getting ready to come out, there's a lot of pressure in the cervix. And so that kind of mimics this. And, and what that stimulates is, again, increase in prostaglandin. Um, which increases the cervical ripening, causing effacement and dilatation. So that's done a couple of ways. One is through a uh, Foley catheter um, that is inserted in the endocervical canal. It could be just a regular Foley catheter that would have like a 30 cc, 20 cc balloon. Um, or it could be a specific catheter called the Cook's catheter um, 
that will be inserted through the cervical os. So with a, a, with a regular Foley catheter, you have to insert it all the way into the cervix, making sure that the balloon is um, past the cervical os and then inflate that balloon. And again, that's gonna cause pressure here. Uh, and with the Cook's catheter, uh, there's pressure both in the internal os and the external os. Um, again, hastening signaling that it is now time to deliver increasing the prostaglandin. The other type of uh, mechanical management is with the use of a hygroscopic dilator. So a hygroscopic dilator, um, there's two uh, main kinds. One is a natural dilator, which is laminaria, and the other one is a synthetic dilator, which is made up of mag sulfate. And um, what that does, is it um here so it's uh, almost looks like a tampon if you will but it's not inserted into the vaginal canal it goes past the vaginal canal into the cervical os and what it's going to do there is um it's going to um uh, absorb the fluid that is in the area and so as it absorbs the fluid, it expands. And again, that expansion um, forces the cervix to dilate uh, and also again, signals the brain to um, increase the, the hormones, um, prostaglandin relaxant so that there could be more cervical dilation um, and hopefully um, increasing, hastening the delivery of the baby. And there you have it, that is preterm and postterm pregnancy.